OK, I'll move on to the next question. So the next one's from Ben about, can you do a more in-depth code review from developer perspective on Chat Copilot, demo how to run slash debug everything locally? Uh, .NET preferred. I'm having issues to understand how the dots are connected. And for example, just trying to add a native semantic and native function in code. More or less, the, just the question about you know walking through it end to end. Uh, I would actually point you to okay. So this video here is part four of the series that you know Teresa and myself we filmed uh, around the latest in Chat Copilot. So if you watch episodes one, two, and three of that, that does the walkthrough, like literally line by line walkthrough of of the Chat Copilot code. Um, granted, it is an old older version of Chat Copilot, but I think the core ideas, core principles are the same. So. I guess, Teresa, do you want to maybe add anything? Yeah, is Ben on this call? Because I can walk through um, some of like the high level files right now. It also might help um, visualize what you guys were talking about, about separating the kernels between the planner and like semantic kernel too. So I could just go ahead and do that really quick. Okay, can you guys see my Let's screen? Zoom in, zoom in a bit more. Okay. So one more level. Yes. OK. Yeah, so basically for the way that this is in the chat copilot repository. So um, every time that a chat request comes in, we spin up a new kernel. It's added as um, a scope service. And you can start in program and then go to the add semantic kernel services, and that's when the kernel is built, and then we register the skills with the kernel. So um, that is done in this method down here, where we add the chat skill, and the chat skill is the one that coordinates the entire bot response request, and then we import the time skill because we just need um, lifetime. And then I just added this new method where I separated out um, these semantic skills and native skill registration. So I have a PR, PR out for that right now. It's in draft, it's a POC, but hopefully that will get merged by the end of today. Um, I'll share that in the chat in a second. But what, how we do this here is you can specify a directory path for your semantic skills and your native skills in app settings.json. And then we'll just take that path and try to parse out the semantic skills and the native skills from it. So for semantic skills, it's pretty straightforward. We just try to find each of the directory that's in that folder, and then we import it using the um, SK prompt files and the config file. And then for native skills, um, this is the code that I just added this morning. It goes through the directory and then it finds every file and the expectation is that the file name should match the class name which should match the class type and then we use reflection to basically instantiate a new um, skill that skill and then we import that skill into the kernel so that's basically how like semantic skills and native skills can be registered with the chat copilot kernel um, and then they're not invoked automatically in order to use these skills that have been imported. You either have to call them from one of the methods that's automatically called whenever a chat response comes or a chat response request comes in, and that starts in chat skill in chat async. Um, I don't know. Yeah, it starts here. So then if you wanted to do anything, you can intercept one of the methods here to call the skill that you've just imported. Or um, I've also, in my PR, I've also had it register with the planner directly. So how this works is we have a semantic kernel that manages the bot response generation and all the requests that come in from the web app. And that includes like the chat async requests, um, importing documents, et cetera. But then we have a separate planner instance that coordinates um, like any additional information that, that may be needed to fulfill that request. So if you need to call like an extra API, you would register that skill with the planner and then the planner uses its own kernel to try to orchestrate um, additional steps. And so 
if you wanted your skill to like automatically be discovered by the planner for the chat request, then you would register it here. And right now it's calling the same like register custom asyncs or custom skills async method that I just showed you. And it's gonna register the same semantic and native skills. And then if it sees that like it would need that function to fulfill the request, like for instance, if I asked chat copilot to add two numbers, um, I added this math skill here. It would, in theory, be able to discover this math skill and then schedule it, send that proposed plan back to the user for approval, and then run it on approval. So that's basically the gist of how you can register skills there. We didn't have that easy of a way to do it before, um, but you can pull my PR and just add your skills to whatever directory and then list that directory there. But the other option to do it, especially if your plugin needs authentication, is this is the chat controller. So it um, coordinates all of the chat requests that come in for Chat Copilot. And how we do it from the web app from the client is, Whenever a plugin is enabled on the client, we send a header containing the auth information in the request. Um, for plugins that don't require header, header, we just have a generic um, like header with like set to true as the value. But if it does require like for GitHub, the value of the header is the GitHub hat that is sent through, and then it's registered in this bearer authentication provider. So it's passed in as the value. And the way these providers work, it works are they're passed in through the constructor and then the constructor saves it as a private class member. And then there's a callback where it's um, an auth callback within each of the providers that provides, um, that exposes that authentication value. So then for whenever you import the plugin, you can pass in that provider with its authentication callback to the auth callback value. So that goes back to what Neil was asking about earlier. But if you wanted to, to just like register your skills um, here, you can do that too. So you can completely like bypass this check that checks to see if the request header has one that's specific to the plugin that you're trying to enable. And then you can just like add this code, um, like say at the end of this method to import your skills on every request. So basically every time the kernel is instantiated because whenever we invoke the kernel, we invoke it in the external information skill. We only invoke the planner if there are functions available in the planner's kernel. So that check is right here. So if there's no native functions or no semantic functions, then um, we just bail out of this skill completely and never invoke the planner. Yeah, so that's it. Um, do you guys have questions there? Teresa, could you comment a little bit about some of this conversation in the chat about uh, short running or sh short lived kernels and how they're supposed to be transient? Or... Um, yeah, so like the kernel can be as lightweight as you want it to be, but like in general, we want it to be transient. So then it basically like handles like whatever you're trying to orchestrate in that moment, and then you can spin up another one. So it's not like long living. Cool. Uh, we have some hands up. Neil, go ahead. Um, so specifically to that um, off um, provider, how does that like materialize to the user? in that that's actually doing like the chatting is there like a, a ui that will ask them hey can you enter the the api key in here or, or how would that work yeah so if you're using so this is specific to chat copilot so um this is not something that's supported by semantic kernel um but chat copilot is meant to be a reference app but if you look here um the way that we set it up is the plugins are in this plugin gallery. And then if it, it needs a auth like authentication value, then it will prompt it for that one. So for GitHub, we just you just need a personal access token. So we ask it for it here. And then that's going to be saved to the React state and then or the Redux state and then sent as the header for the request anytime a request is made whenever this is enabled. For graph, 
you can't see that, but for graph, um, it would put you through the whole like Microsoft login flow. And then for Jira, this one is asking for like an email and then a personal access token. But then Klarna is an example of one that like doesn't have any authentication. So you can just like enable it. And then whenever you enable it, it will just tag a Klarna header in the request with the value of true. This is awesome. Thank you. Uh, yeah. how, how would we get um, inside of this um, list of available plugins? So if you're planning to add it from the web API, which is like the kernel side, the back end, then you would have to go back to the web app side on chat copilot and add that plugin yourself. But um, you can add it here from this custom plugin. So what we require is the same thing that chat GPT requires where you have to enter your domain for your plugin manifest. And then your plugin manifest should contain an open AI definition and we'll parse that definition in. And let me see, I don't know that I have one in my, okay, yeah, I do have one. I was testing with Instacart, but basically like, whenever you add this plugin, it will add the, it will automatically render a card for you. And for Instacart, it doesn't require any kind of authentication. So then you just enable it like you do for Klarna and then it will tag the, um, header respectively in the request. Um, if this is disabled, that header won't be present in the request. And then if for like some reason, Instacart had required a authentication, then that's specified in your manifest plugin. And we only support no auth or user level auth like the GitHub Pat now, um, but it would auto um, automatically generate the right UX for you if you go through and add it this way. And then when you add it this way, it's automatically registered with the planner whenever it hits the web API. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Isaac, you have your hand up. Yep. So um, we talked to, like in the chat, there was a lot of talk about like um, semantic kernel being lightweight so that you can just create them and only have them live for short amounts of time. So um, with, with that idea, um, would that mean that you would like a, a typical flow? Because like you can imagine like a sort of like a chat bot kind of thing uh, where people are asking questions with a typical flow. Do you guys recommend then you create a kernel, register functions to the kernel and then call the functions and immediately discard the object? Like what's the what's the recommendation here? based on this concept of it being transient. Yeah, what's your use case? Um, we've got an organization um, and um, there's a bunch of different chatbots right now. We've got our own custom implementation, but I'd like to mm -hmm. switch over to semantic kernel because it provides structure. Um, but effectively, uh, you can imagine it's a school there's a hundred different courses taught at the school mm -hmm. and each course is supposed to have its own chatbot that answers questions based on automatically trained course content um, and so ideally everything is sandboxed which is what we were discussing a couple minutes ago and this just brought me the idea if everything is sandboxed then um, how to implement that with this idea of making things lightweight and transient like would you recommend because these chatbots they're global with respect to one class. Um, every single person in the class has the same chatbot, um, but they're different between classes. So effectively, mm -hmm. I want to know, would it be better to keep it alive since everyone shares the same one or still keep them as temporary things? Yeah, I would recommend just keeping them as transient because your memory should be like handled elsewhere, like the way that whatever the chatbot, whatever is building, right. like the context of the chatbot, like the embeddings and stuff are stored somewhere else. So then um, the approach that we took for chat copilot is um, instantiating a new kernel on every request. And then, that's what I want to know. OK, yeah. And then it handles like it has all the functions registered at the beginning of the request and then it can just discard it after. OK, OK, OK. So then a chat bot sort of becomes a question of pull the necessary information for the database that defines the chat bot, 
create the kernel, which should be the same for everything. They all all bots are going to be like a class, but they're all going to have their own, and they're all going to have the same kind of fields. In other mm -hmm. words, it's just one flow for every bot. You create a, a kernel. Um, yeah. You register the function since all the bots are pretty much the same, and then that's it. And then theoretically, there could be different types of bots, which would then have different fields. So that's sorry, that's just me thinking out loud. But thank you. That that answers my question. Yeah, you're right. And so I would recommend the way that you think about it is basically like you basically instantiate this kernel, and then you can t specify it like or register which functions are specific to that chatbot that you want for that class. Or like yeah. even if you register like a chat skill and then you can tell it to basically use different personas per chatbot, but it would be still be like one kernel calling it each time. Oh, thank you, Harris, uh, John, sorry. That's a really good point um, because they do need to be load balanced at some point. Okay, thank you. If I may add a comment on this, uh, there are there might be situation in which we might want to have two i kernels configured to go to different memory stores or something like that. In this situation, oh, right. we can use that, like a named uh, instance, like for the HTTP channel, when we can get a GitHub channel, and so you basically register two i kernel, and then by string you can get the proper one if you need to make a distinction. Mm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, guys. Yeah, very good discussion. And John's comment uh, that Isaac thought was good was long running kernels would hamper your ability to work behind a load balancer. I reinitialize and reload relevant data each request. So for those who are listening to the recording. 